A bad look on the bridge in Jacksonville. Pride Month colors suddenly removed, then reappearing. Who was behind it and what's the impact? Plus, the governor's pen signed Florida's largest budget. It also wiped out millions for local programs. We'll talk to a couple of the people whose programs were vetoed on This Week in Jacksonville. Thank you for with us, being with us today, that is. So the lights on the Acosta Bridge in downtown Jacksonville, they are usually blue. JTA often, however, changes the color scheme to recognize causes, holidays, or people. All week this week, it was supposed to be all the colors of the rainbow for Pride Month. Instead, the lights were changed back to blue and then back to the rainbow again. Joining us now, Jimmy Midyet, a local attorney who's fought for equal rights for more than 15 years here in Jacksonville, currently the North Florida Development Officer for Equality Florida. Jimmy, just your first reaction this last Tuesday when we saw that the colors had changed back to blue. Well, I can say Monday night I was super proud, and by Tuesday afternoon, whenever we realized that the lights weren't going to be rainbow again on Tuesday night, I was very disappointed and shocked. First thing that goes through your mind is, is this an attack on the gay community? Is that, is that part of the reaction? That's, that was certainly my first thought, and having looked at some of the other events that have taken place at the highest levels of state government this month, I, I just thought this was the next domino uh, in that line. Yeah. We're going to work through what we've heard. Obviously, we went into investigative mode right away. Um, that was Tuesday. Then by Wednesday, the lights were back on and scheduled to be through uh, the, the end of the weekend, back all the colors of the rainbow. I've heard you talk to other reporters during this week as well. How do you feel about, well, we got back on track after that blip on Tuesday? It's a really good feeling to be back on track. It's unfortunate that we had to go through all of the things as a community that we did in order to get that to happen. But we, we feel much better now that the lights are back on and that we can celebrate Pride Month yeah. with pride. We're, we're seeing some of the video from uh, the bridge this week. And as we understand it, there were some complaints that came in. And so... Florida Department of Transportation or JTA got into this. Matter of fact, I, I want to walk through that uh, if that's okay. JTA sent a statement. Uh, they were first to release a statement on, on the lights Tuesday. They said, uh, this afternoon, the FDOT informed the JTA that our scheduled color scheme for the Acosta Bridge is out of compliance with our existing permit. The JTA will comply accordingly. I will point out that many of us have tried to talk to the leader of JTA since then, and Nat Ford has uh, declined those interview requests. The, uh, the FDOT, their initial response was, uh, aesthetic lighting on the Acosta Bridge is owned and operated by JTA. Questions about their lighting system, function, and permits should be referred to JTA. And then finally, on Wednesday, the FDOT spokesperson sent this. While the schematic yesterday was not previously submitted or approved, in accordance with the bridge lighting policy, the department has since authorized its use, and this is obviously a matter of broad community interest. Uh, Jimmy Mignette, this seems like a lot of finger pointing going on there. A lot of finger pointing going, there, going on there, and it was really tough to follow just for folks in the community because, you know, uh, clearly I had the reaction that I had, oh my gosh, this is Governor DeSantis. Um, but then we learned subsequently that it wasn't necessarily from the governor. That's certainly what his office says. Right. Um, and, and so then it, we were told that JTA was somehow at a compliance with a permit but then it came out that, no, in fact, there were some complaints that must have come in um, very early in the day on Tuesday. And unfortunately, uh, we came in only on a telephone that, with no public records. Right. You, you know, we strive to be balanced and show each side. So I do want to point out, I spoke personally to the communications director for the governor's office. She is adamant that the governor did not have anything to do with the decision about the bridge lights, said that was a local issue, and they'd start looking into it. Taryn Fenske also said that on social media and to other reporters as well. When we talked to uh, other people, including Senator Audrey Gibson, who's from Jacksonville, she said she called FDOT and said, come on, tell me what's going on here. Her view seemed to be, this feels like, is this, is this uh, compliance always handled the same way, or is this just a compliance issue because it's about Pride Month? Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts? Well, I can say this. There are two other communities in Florida right now that are having the same problem with FDOT. So if it's local control or local decision, then maybe the FDOT folks up here need to let the folks down in Sarasota and St. Pete know that, that they're free to go ahead with their lighting. Um, what it seems like to me is that someone may be either at direction from someone in Tallahassee or perhaps just in line with how someone in Tallahassee has behaved this month, 
that's how we got to the situation. So before we run out of time, what are those things that you say, how someone behaved? I think you're, you're talking about the governor or some laws that have been penned and, and signed this, this past month, right? Sure, Ken. On the very first day of Pride, the governor issued or signed the law to ban transgender young people from sports in Florida. That he did on the very first day of Pride. Of course, we heard that he said that that wasn't related. Then on the second day of Pride, he vetoed, line item vetoed some funding to help the Pulse survivors with their mental health challenges. Um, we're coming up on the five-year anniversary of the Pulse massacre on Saturday. Um, and so for me, this was just the third, as I say, this was just the third, uh, certainly looked like the third issue where the governor had been weighing in anti to the LGBT community. And so certainly on this third issue, the governor's office says, nope, nothing to do with that. Tell me though, we've got about a minute left, tell me how this impacts um, the community and how it feels for somebody who's part of the LGBTQ plus community to have these things go on. I'll tell you, it, it, it's frustrating. You know, we worked for a very long time in the community here in Jacksonville to get the human rights ordinance passed. And then it feels like every time we want to get something done for the community here, it's one step forward and two steps back. So I was worried that, that we were looking at that. Perhaps that's not the case for this situation with the bridge. Um, the community rallied quickly together. And um, as far as we're concerned, we, we have a great deal of pride and we're looking forward to celebrating the rest of June. Yeah, and Jimmy Mignette, I, I appreciate it. I, I reliable source to go to and talk to about some of these issues. Appreciate the time today. Anytime, Ken, thank you. Thank you. All right, so coming up, a record-setting budget in Florida set to begin July 1st. State lawmaker Travis Hudson is our guest next on This Week in Jacksonville. At Farrah and Farrah, we specialize in accidents involving commercial trucks. Don't let the insurance company play around with your future. Call us. Getting your air ducts thoroughly cleaned takes the trained professionals at Stanley Steamer using the most powerful equipment to get the most powerful results. Our equipment goes deep inside your ducts, removing years of dirt, pet hair, allergens, even dust mites. Unlike other air duct cleaning companies, Stanley Steamer cleans your entire system. Just look at how much dirt can be removed. Call today for a free inspection and save $50 on a cleaning. Stanley Steamer gets your home. It's your guardian angel. It's your muse. It's your smart dress, tech and tent, safety obsessed superhero. The Hyundai Sonata and Elantra. Hey, your journey. Own it. Now get 0% APR plus 1,000 bonus cash on the Elantra or Sonata or up to 2,500 in savings. Visit buyhyundai.com today. Get moving with the Planet Fitness Black Card and check out all the perks for zero enrollment, $22.99 a month, now through June 16th. Like access to over 2,000 locations? You got it. Bring a guest anytime. That's right. And relax and unwind with massage chairs and more. Plus get tons of variety and space to move in our super clean clubs. Your fitness is essential. Get the PF Black Card for zero enrollment and $22.99 a month. Hurry, deal ends June 16th. Get the PF Black Card for no enrollment fee plus no commitment. Hurry, offer ends June 16th. Oh, baby, are you going my way? I see you kicking out for hours a day, so baby, don't know you at all. I'm not crazy or a fiend. I'm not, not stuck or a fiend. La, la, how you know what? Monaco check and lock down your money with security from Chase. Control feels good. Chase, make more of what's yours. Things seem to get more expensive as years go by. Take groceries. Prices have been going up there. And keeping up with your health? That's up too. But did you know at FPL, what you pay for energy has gone down over the last 15 years? And that's something we can take to the bank. Get your new old glory from your fellow Americans on The Morning Show, Monday. Thursday, June 17th, The Local Station is celebrating eight years of Positively Jacks. We'll be showing you how the movement helped make Jacksonville a better place to live. We want to do even more, but we need your help. Sign up at PositivelyJacks.com and take the pledge. We'll send you volunteer opportunities and ways you can make a difference throughout the year. Positively Jacks Day. Sign up to Positively Jacks. 
You're watching This Week in Jacksonville with Kent Justice. Thanks for staying with us today. Florida Senator Travis Hudson is with us, uh, representing St. John's County, Flagler, Volusia. I wanted to get you way in. Late this week, uh, the Florida State Board of Education, they were meeting in Jacksonville, and among those things, the headline that came out is that they banned critical race theory from public school classrooms, adopting new rules it said would shield school children from curricula that could, and they put in parentheses, distort historical events. What's your thought on this, and how does this apply? Why is this a, a good thing to do for our, our children here in Florida? Yeah, I think what we need to look at when you look at the school board, it's, or the, the, the state board itself, they're constantly looking at ways to improve our system. We had Common Core back in the day with math that was completely uh, Not new, effective, right? pro progressive way to do it, but right. parents didn't understand it, kids didn't understand it. So I think what we're trying to do is get back to the classical teaching, back to history and what history really is, back to the Constitution as it looks for civics uh, education, and make sure that we're doing the things that we've done when, when you and I were in school so that the kids are learning exactly how we've done in the past. And that's where we were getting our good grades, our good SAT scores. And we were actually seeing our kids graduate at higher and higher, higher levels. The, the debate that goes on is there's one side of this argument that says, hey, wait, we need to teach that there's an impact on uh, indigenous people in America, African Americans, people of color that doesn't get taught in the way that you and I, you know, went to school or whatever. What, what, yeah, how would you well, argue and I, that? I would argue there's there's two ways to look at it. it if you're talking about K through 12, you give the kids the facts and the history. If you want to talk about theory and, th and different theories of the way things are done, that's more of a college level course where, where you have more of a political debate about what's right and wrong. But for a, for a young mind, give them the facts, give them the actual history, and then if they want to try and get into a debate back and forth, that's something that you would do as you get older into the higher, very higher ed uh, type of things. Uh, so let's talk about politics and some debates. You and uh, State Representative Cindy Stevenson, I know you got your colleagues to approve appropriation for Flagler College this year. There was $250,000 in the budget for Hotel Ponce de Leon preservation and restoration. And then after the budget's submitted, then the governor has a chance with his veto pen to say, no, thank you. That happened there. It also happened on a, a program that you push for the school district. How do you respond as lawmakers when the executive office says, nope, uh, I don't agree with you. I, I don't agree with all of you state lawmakers. I'm going to line eyed on that out. Yeah, well, we did get a lot in the budget. If you look at all the projects we put in, I think we have one of the biggest water projects with the beach restoration in St. John's County. Uh, we had a good road project that we did that actually leads up to the new high school to get them a new entrance before it opens. So we got a lot of good things in there. Uh, when you go to the, bu the, the budget process with the governor's office, you've got to fight for every dollar. You don't always get what you, what, what you want, but you do get a, a good deal of about it, so I, I think the projects that he did that he did get for us was was a wonderful thing. I think you're going to see a lot of benefit in the area there. Uh, the other projects, I think we come back next year. We fight even harder for. Good news is we've checked the important, you know, some of the important ones off, so we can now move up the priority list and, and work on work on that with his with his office. Will there be a battle next year about gaming or gambling or what have you? Obviously, so there was a, a special session this year uh, about the gaming compact, and I guess I, I know that you had submitted like nine bills uh, at one point. The legislature working through this after the governor had come to an agreement uh, with Seminole Tribe about uh, gaming. Are you satisfied the state of Florida got the, the best deal it could, the best terms? Yeah, we were. Okay. I've been working on this for four years, and the deal has always changed a little bit one way or another, whether you're dealing with the tribe, the paramutuals, any other gaming interest, or the governor. And this is really the first year where we got so darn close to it that the governor finally came in and said, let's finish this thing. And it's. I think it's the best deal we possibly could get. Uh, we, we certainly gave, you have to, with the share agreement, you have to give the tribe exclusivity. So we've given them some exclusivity. But at the same time, we were able to keep the designated player games that the paramutuals wanted. On top of that, we let the designated player uh, games get into the, the fantasy or the sports betting arena if they want to. So there's, there's a lot of different avenues there. It's going in front of, the, in front of IGRA at the federal level. It must be approved. Uh, I think they have until sometime in August to approve that. And then we will see uh, sports betting hopefully in October, uh, which is the condition of, of the bill. So hopefully by October, if you're a Jags fan and they're doing well, you can pull up your phone and you can give them a little more encouragement. <laughs> so uh, a couple of things there. Um, there are a lot of folks who said, no, you can't do this gaming compact because it expands gambling. And we already voted that we as the citizens of Florida have a right to vote on that. 
What's the response there? Well, there's two things. You've got to look at how it was written in, in terms of Amendment 3. Amendment 3 said the citizens will have a right if it goes outside the confines of the compact. We did not go outside the confines of the compact. We stayed within the compact, and we made sure that the gambling happened on Seminole property with the servers where there's actual federal precedents for that from two states, New Jersey and Oklahoma. So we took what was, what was given to us with the parameters of, of Amendment 3, and we stayed within that confine. And then I'd also heard you talking about, maybe we have to deal with this later, the daily fantasy sports kind of things, uh, yeah. DraftKings or whatever. Yeah, there were a couple of things that we filed, the, the daily fantasy sports, the DraftKings, some bingo stuff that we're going to have to come back and look at. Uh, there'll be some tweaks next year, so you probably will see a bill uh, that has to deal with gaming. But what we did, should this pass, is we create a gaming commission that deals with all unlicensed, unregulated uh, sports betting or games that are in Florida. While there's a loophole for fantasy sports and why people could play it now, even though it's technically not legal, when you set up a gaming commission that's supposed to go after unlicensed activity, they could fall within that loophole and they could be shut down in theory. So I want to go back and protect that because I know a lot of people that do, does that fantasy sports either weekly or daily. Yeah, you know, well, it was interesting hearing how some of these, the, the compact had come together and some of the terms there. Uh, Senator, I think we were about out of time. We'll wrap up, but uh, I appreciate your time. And I obviously, you said you've been working on it four years, four years. plus the other duties you have as a, a state lawmaker uh, and a special session. So thanks for explaining and thanks for taking the time. Thank you. Pleasure. Well, Senator Hudson isn't the only local connection on the bummer end of a gubernatorial veto. The leader of 100 black men of Jacksonville and the program that won't get the help he hoped for. That's next on This Week in Jacksonville. Stay with us. Vacation in your own backyard with patio sets up to 70% off only at Splash. Dining sets, sitting groups, the entire stock up to 70% off, plus zero interest financing available. Get your backyard vacation ready and save now at Splash. At Harold and Harold, we're focused on helping people. You can be minding your own business one second, and the next second, you're the victim of somebody else's negligence. If this happens to you, call Harold and Harold, 251-1111. Oh, that spin class was brutal. Well, you can try using the Buick's massaging seat. Oh, yeah, that's nice. Can I use Apple CarPlay to put some music on? Sure, it's wireless. What's your Buick's Wi-Fi password? It's uh, Buick Envision. That's a really tight spot. I used to hate parallel parking. Me too. The all-new Buick Envision, built around you, all of you. Current eligible Buick owners get 3,200 purchase allowance on 2021 Envision models when you finance through GM Financial. See your local Buick dealer. The Hot Tub Expo has been held over at Premier Outdoor. Last weekend, we lost all our power from the storms. No internet, no phones, nothing. So now we've held it over. One last weekend. Save thousands on this sale. Hot buys this Friday, Saturday, and Monday. Our Hot Tub Expo is held over. I'm Wadia, and there's more to me than HIV. There's my career, my calls, and creating my dream home. I'm a work in progress. So much goes into who I am. HIV medicine is one part of it. Devato is for some adults who are starting HIV-1 treatment or replacing their current HIV-1 regimen. With just two medicines and one pill, Devato is as effective as a three-drug regimen to help you reach and stay undetectable. You can take Devato any time of day, with food or without. Don't take Devato if you're allergic to its ingredients or if you take Defetilide. Taking Devato with Defetilide can cause serious or life-threatening side effects. Hepatitis B can become harder to treat while on Devato. Don't stop Devato without talking to your doctor, as your hepatitis B may worsen or become life-threatening. Serious or life-threatening side effects can occur, including allergic reactions, lactic acid buildup, and liver problems. If you have a rash and other symptoms of an allergic reaction, stop Devato and get medical help right away. Tell your doctor if you have kidney or liver problems, or if you are, may be, or plan to be pregnant. Devato may harm your unborn baby. Use effective birth control while on Devato. Do not breastfeed while taking Devato. Most common side effects are headache, nausea, diarrhea, trouble sleeping, tiredness, and anxiety. So much goes into who I am and hope to be. Ask your doctor if Devato is right for you.
Vacation in your own backyard with a hot tub for only $89 a month only at Splash. That's right, hot tubs on sale for as low as $89 a month or swim to a healthier you in a swim spa. Get your backyard vacation ready and save now at Splash. You're watching This Week in Jacksonville on Channel 4. Ronnie King is president of the group 100 Black Men of Jacksonville. Now, I spoke with him this week following the news that a bill giving a million dollars to a project called Coding in Color passed the state's legislative session and then got killed by the governor's veto. The 100 Black Men of Jacksonville is actually a chapter of the 100 Black Men of America. And uh, essentially, we are a mentoring program. We uh, focus on middle and high school uh, students, primarily young boys. Um, but we cover everything from financial literacy to academic uh, improvement to health, uh, mental wellness, and, and all of the uh, above. So uh, really, you know, at the core of our, our work is mentoring and, and helping the community any way that we can. How long has this program been going on, Ronnie? Absolutely. So the, the 100 Black Men of Jacksonville has been in existence for over 20 years uh, here in the city. But our Coding in Color uh, program has been going on for the last three summers. Uh, we've had an uh, excellent turnout and, and uh, you know, really uh, looking forward to, you know, continuing this, this particular program. Let's dive in there. This coding and color program, that's what I wanted to talk to you about. This House Bill 3169 was passed by the House and Senate, and it's in the budget, and then it gets to the governor's desk, and the governor vetoed it. Uh, as I understand, it was about a million dollars. Um, what do you think about that veto? How does that change what you're able to accomplish uh, with this coding and color program? I tell you, uh, you know, this has uh, primarily been a summer program. And so over the last several years, we've had over 150 students come each summer uh, to learn these, these coding camps. And so what we wanted to do is really try to expand this to an after school program um, where we are offering these coding classes and the STEM instruction, uh, not just during the summer, but after school. And so this particular appropriation was really going to go a long way in terms of um, helping us, you know, uh, do that. Uh, obviously, we, we were hoping for the best, but, uh, you know, we were planning for the worst. And so uh, we, we plan to continue moving forward with those original after school uh, plans and projections and and hoping that we can uh, make it work. And I'm confident that we will. It was one of those years because of pandemic where everyone thought because of the economy, the budget would be smaller. Then a lot of federal money came in. The budget is the largest the state's ever had. Is it disappointing to you? Is it confusing even that this program would get the veto uh, when so much money is being spent in the state? You know, it, it, when it comes to the politics of the, the state budget, uh, you know, we try not to get too much into that. Um, I, I know we put a lot of faith uh, into our local uh, politicians here. And so uh, uh, um, Senator um, Audrey Gibson and, and uh, Representative uh, Angie Nixon and Tracy Davis, as well as Senator Jones down in South Florida, all of them uh, did a great job in, in terms of fighting for this particular appropriation and trying to really explain the importance of getting these students um, introduced to STEM, introducing, uh, introducing them to software engineering, and hopefully getting them prepared for, you know, jobs and and the careers of the future. And so, um, you know, again, I, we, we try not to, to guess and, and, and make speculations on why things were vetoed or, or not vetoed, but, um, you know, we just do what we can. Ron, is this something where you'll do it again? Do you want uh, the representatives and the senators to push this forward next time around as well? Oh, absolutely. You know, we think um, this program isn't going anywhere. Um, we're very, very proud that we were able to grow it to this point. Um, really, you know, with just the help of, of some local um, funders uh, and actually the, the city of Jacksonville through the Kids Hope Alliance has been an excellent supporter of this particular program over the last few summers. And so, um, you know, we're, we, we're very proud of where we've grown it to and we still look forward to expanding it and we absolutely plan on trying again next year. How many people has this program influenced or helped in these few years that, that you've been using it? We've uh, actually helped over 300 and 50 kids over the first two summers. Um, and then we had to actually go into kind of a virtual setting, um, obviously with COVID on the third summer. But uh, surprisingly, we had students coming from as far as California, um, all the way down to Miami, Florida, um, Maryland. And so uh, that particular COVID, I guess we call it the COVID uh, coding color summer camp, uh, we were able to reach up to 400 students during that summer. So, um, you know, we've, we've been able to reach a lot of kids. And at the end of the day, these kids who get this experience in coding in color, 
Uh, where does that put them in terms of a career path or what does it do for their future? The biggest part of Coding in Color is really just exposure to uh, uh, software engineering. And I like to kind of distinguish between software engineering and just overall STEM. You know, software engineering is kind of a very specific discipline of STEM. And so uh, what it's done is, you know, they're able to come in and learn things like data analytics. Um, they're learning stuff like just basic uh, um, programming, mobile app programming, HTML, things like that. But the biggest part of it is exposure. And what has come of that is we've had students after the Coding and Color summer camps that have reached back out uh, to us. And so we've been working with those students uh, beyond the summer and just trying to get them to hone their skills and, and, and perfect their craft. Um, and we try to treat it just like a you know, basketball team or any other after school program where you know, we know students need to constantly work on these skills. And we believe that the Coding and Color camp has really exposed a lot of students to, to do that. Mr. King says that he's working through Jacksonville City Council right now to see if they can help with some funding for the Coding in Color program. He really wants it to be year-round rather than just summers. And he says he also plans to try at the state level again next year. All right, so the race to represent Florida in the United States Senate, that's taking shape this week. Congresswoman Val Demings declared she is a candidate. Demings is originally from here in Jacksonville. She's considered an immediate front runner in the Democratic primary for U.S. Senate. The winner will challenge incumbent Republican Senator Marco Rubio. He was first elected back in 2010. He's a former presidential candidate, and Congresswoman Demings was an impeachment prosecutor against President Trump. So, uh, Val Demings. I have to go back to being a law enforcement officer. Uh, it didn't matter to me, your gender, your race, how much money you had in the bank, and certainly your political party. What mattered to me was building a better future for people regardless of who they were. In the weeks ahead, the voters of Florida are gonna be reminded of my record of significant and common sense achievements. And they're also gonna learn more about how ineffective and far left and extremist the real Val Demings is when she's in Washington. In 2022, Florida is going to have a choice between two very different candidates and two very different records. Demings will have to win the Democratic primary to face Rubio in the general, but Rubio has already been out criticizing Demings, taking to Twitter. That was an hour after the announcement. He was trying to characterize her as hard left and then portray his own record as sensible, certainly a race we will follow over the course of the next uh, year and a half, really. All right, so what should you be looking for on This Week in Jacksonville in the weeks to come? Incoming Jacksonville City Council President Sam Newby joins us next time. We will also interview Council Member Jacoby Pittman. And developer Steve Adkins will explain his vision for the North Bank. We showed you all that last week. He's going to talk next week about how he hopes to overcome some of the obstacles in his way to make that happen. This Week in Jacksonville is each Sunday morning at this time. I'm Kent Justice. Thanks for watching on air on Channel 4 and the CW17 and online at news4jax.com. See why every day more people are choosing News 4 Jax, Northeast Florida and South Georgia's number one source for local news.